Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 309 of Real Blend, the podcast that is back with a vengeance. And by that, I mean surfing on dump trucks, pouring water in from three gallons into five gallons. And promoting a new book called Bruce Willis by Sean O'Connell, the managing editor of Cinema Blend and the co-host of the Real Blend podcast. Boys, I'm holding it in my hands. It's coming out. It's June 11th. It's almost here. And Gabe, Gabe set up that little joke at the beginning. I'm just I'm, I'm so happy that the opening joke wasn't a podcast coming back harder. It's true. It could have been that. <laughs> <laughs> we jumped to with a vengeance because I know that's Kevin's. It's okay. In a hard. couple of months, it'll be a podcast that lived free and died hard. Oh, <laughs> well done. Thank you. Mm, well done. Kevin, uh, I really wish that you uh, were able to join me for Rennie Harlan, where we yeah. could, we discussed at length Die Hard 2 versus uh, With a Vengeance. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I mean, Rennie just has to know that with a vengeance is just so far superior to both McTiernan and Harlan's films. So I, I would imagine oh. that he fully, he fully agrees with that because with the vengeance is the best diehard as mm. is back to the future three, as is Lord of the Rings three, as is Indy three. And that's it for the three. It's an unusual. Jackass Jack three. three. Yeah. No, Jack, no, there's Jack one. Jackass three is actually really great. <laughs> I love Jackass three. Yeah, it's really good, actually. <laughs> no, Kevin, don't you also think uh, uh, Return of the Jedi? Yep, Return of the Jedi is my favorite Star Wars, yep. Really I'm a three unusual. guy. You're a three guy. <laughs> you are a three guy. Uh, <laughs> on this week's show, we're going to... Well, so not Renny Harlan. If you want to listen to Renny Harlan, go back to our previous episodes. Just but for those know, keeping count, have... Kevin has been introduced and I have not. Just well, I haven't Kevin introduced to... anybody yet. I just said I just said hello to Kevin. By the way... I mean, oh, hello, Jake. How are you, no, sir? No, no. Go, uh, update the count. We're back. We've been back up, for eight minutes. I'm shaking up the the intro here. I'm, I'm just You're shaking up my feelings. I'm going to introduce you. Everyone like knows jazz. who you guys are now at this point. Yes, Kevin. What impression am I doing right now? It's Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Clint Eastwood. That's the fact that we all know each other so well that we can go. Clint oh, Eastwood. that's that's Clint Eastwood from Kevin's <laughs> interview with him for uh, for <laughs> Sully. Yes, it is. <laughs> but people who don't know what we're talking about. We know room. each other's work way too much. Yeah, way I was interviewing much. Clint Eastwood for Sully and he decided to eat peanuts during the entire interview, which was incredibly. <laughs> I was an honor. I was honored. I, the only thing I was upset about is he didn't offer me any. During the interview, that was the only thing. Would you have taken the peanuts out of his hand? I'm kind of hungry, Mr. Eastwood. I mean, like, (laughs) please (laughs) make my day, please. (laughs) (laughs) I was trying to think of a really good clip. You feel hungry, punk? (laughs) 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 That interview Uh, wasn't even supposed to happen. I was in the hallway and he came down to do some uh, IMAX reads and Tom Hanks's room was just sitting open for 20 minutes before Hanks got there. And they're like, hey, Mr. Eastwood, do you want to just jump in and do a couple interviews? I just happened to be standing right there. I wasn't even prepped. They just threw me in the room. Oh, I like the idea right that time. he was walking, eating peanuts. <laughs> they said, you want to do some interviews? He just turned around, looked at you and said, what you got? <laughs> just didn't, didn't even move. He's like, it was, it was incredible. incredible. It was incredible. Uh, on this week's show, let's focus, let's focus, boys. Come on. On this week's show, uh, another legend is going to be joining us. Richard Linklater. Uh, is going to be joining us to talk about the film Hitman and his career. Jake had to fly solo on that one. Uh, I want let's talk about up front just briefly about the fact that we've been scattered to the winds, um, and you guys have been paying attention to the fact that like I've done an interview, Jake has done an interview, Kevin and I did Kevin Costner yesterday. Um, we are con- making a concerted effort to get all of us back together. It's just life has been incredibly difficult. Our schedules have been incredibly difficult. Um, and so that's why we've had a couple of random interviews where we had some one offs and, and each of the guys stepped in to handle it. Jake took this one. We'll uh, let him talk about Link later on the other side of it. And then we're going to review Hitman a little bit later on in the show. We're not going to be able to catch up on everything that we missed over the past few weeks. And 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 briefly, I want to talk about the fact that, like, there's some apathy about the stuff that's in the box office. Like, I have not gone out to the box office to go see things that I've missed, like If and Apes. I think I'm going to go this weekend to see Bad Boys. I think I I think I have to go see Bad Boys on the big screen. But we'll talk about that later on in the show. Kev, you're you're probably going Thursday night, right? Tomorrow night. We're recording on Wednesday. I'm seeing it tomorrow night in IMAX. I, there's a shot out there if people want to look online that they released the behind the scenes shot of Will Smith filming a shootout. Have you guys seen this where he's he's yeah, connected yeah. to some like, kind of? I don't think it looks good. 
Oh, in the movie. I, I, it doesn't I, look good. I, I, well, they show in the clip that Kevin's talking about, they show sort of the rig that, that Will Smith is wearing, which looks really cool. The idea of it looks awesome. But then at the end of this clip, they show what the actual final product looks like. And I think Ooh. it looks like crap. I oh, like I dis- oh, I disagree. I disagree. Did you, 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 you with the final, with the actual, what the final shot looks it, like? I haven't seen it in the movie, but I no, think I haven't in, seen, I haven't in, seen in the, the movie moment, either. it looks, a, it looks a little video, video gamey. Yeah, that's, see, that's I my issue. Looks, with that. it's, I, I think they were more impressed with the rig than they were the actual final product. But someone said, cause those two guys, Bilal and Adil are rumored to take over Spider-Man four. Mm-hmm. And they said, can you imagine them coming up with something inventive like this for a Spider-Man? But already, the uh, Garfield movies they already did the shot of like his hands no, doing that. Garf- Garfield doesn't do that in his movie. That was Chris Pratt. Oh, God. Now took I remember why it's been so long. <laughs> it took you a minute. That was there. really, you really good, written by the way. How many books? <laughs> that was that None was of them excellent. are funny. None of them are funny. <laughs> I promise yeah. you. That. And, it, and it wasn't webs. It was lasagna. Yeah, yes, it he was, was shooting. Pasta. Yeah, yeah, cheese, pasta. cheese <laughs> strands. Uh, welcome back to YouTube. If you're watching us here, thank you for joining us. Head down, <laughs> give us a like and a subscribe. Share the show with your friends. It's youtubecom backslash Blend podcast. If you would like to sign up for Real Blend Premium, get an ad free version of the show. Uh, a newsletter for me every Friday. Check the description for information on where you can sign up. Okay, Richard Linklater, weirdly enough, is somebody that we haven't had on the show before. Uh, has made some terrific films, obviously School of Rock, Dazed and Confused, uh, Boyhood, which he filmed over a long period of time. He has tapped into the Glenn Powell magic. This is the the summer of Glenn Powell. It's been the years of Glenn Powell, and I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. Michelle and I finally caught up with um, Anyone But You. Mm. And uh, boy, that movie's silly. Yeah, <laughs> it's really goofy. Yeah. Um, at, but he's a movie star. I mean, mm-hmm. th- that that shines through that. That is is a uh, an obvious fact is that that dude can do just about anything. Um, so Link later joined us to talk about the the film Hitman, which we're going to review on the other side. As I mentioned, Jake handled this one solo. So uh, without further ado, here's Richard Link later talking about his new film Hitman coming to Netflix. <laughs> Mr. Linklater, I am a massive, massive fan and from Houston, Texas. So oh, I truly wow. do appreciate uh, you taking the time, sir. Thank H-Town. you so much. All the way. Let's do it. All the way, man. And, and we'll, get, we'll get into that. I couldn't help but laugh out loud whenever I saw the opening title card, which says that this is kind of somewhat of a true story. And I've always sort of wondered, like, to what degree do filmmakers put that up there? Because it is kind of funny and I think it sort of makes us laugh. But also it is, to some degree, kind of honest as well. Yeah, no, it's totally honest. Like, I kind of don't like these movies that say, this is a true story based on true... You know, it's always like, ah, do you... How, you know, I didn't want to exaggerate. And by the end of the movie, it really makes it clear, okay, that didn't happen. We made that part up. I I just didn't want to be one of those full of crap movies saying, oh, this is all real. And we're, we're really honest about it. It's like the article this is based on ends about a third of the way through the movie when he lets her go. She's soliciting the murder of her, you know, husband. And from that point on, when she gets back, that's when our movie kind of takes a thrill ride turn. And that part didn't really happen, but we're, we're kind of grounded in the real Gary Johnson, his occupations, who he is, that all those relationships. And, you know, so we, we were working from that place. So, you know, in my mind, he's real. It's all very real. That whole thing is a kind of a fun um, jumping off fantasy, you know, so. Well, I was going to add, like, is it meant to, because because you are being honest, is it meant to make me laugh? Like, like, it, like yeah. I feel like that's a, just a great note to kind of start this, this insane story but off with. You could, but let's break it down. You could say that about almost anything. You know, name any historical movie, you know, when I see, oh, just say Saving Private Run. It's like, okay, that's a somewhat true. Yeah, there was one guy who was a family they went and got, but that's not, you know, it's movies are reconstructions. They're fake. They're constructs. They're, you know, you can't make a true anything. So they're all at Even best. Fargo. Isn't Fargo like completely fabricated and they still put the based on a true story? Yeah. Title card they're, there? they're sending up the whole genre of this is a true story. You know, it's not. But then what is? I, I just think we're kidding ourselves when we think, oh, we can actually recreate. I think the best you can, and I've done this a number of times with things that really happen, real people. 
I think you just, even going back to eras you weren't even alive, but are based on historical record, which I find fun. I love that. But all you're doing is taking all the facts you could have, all the information you have, and doing your best to try to recreate what that must have been like, filter through your own viewpoints and stuff. So, But you're not saying this is how it was. How do you know? You weren't there. Even if you were there, it's probably not that accurate. I've done films right out of my own life, like Days and Confused, but it's still not, you know, it's still a movie that didn't happen on that night. That was kind of the greatest hits of my freshman year in high school, you know, crammed into one day. So it didn't never happen like that, but it's, it's of a world that's authentic to me, you know. I love that. Honestly, one of the worst things you can do is like watch one of the like the, the Disney inspirational sports movies and then actually Wikipedia what happened because it just really ruins the whole sort of illusion of that. So I, I, I get what you're saying. Um, there were I have to be honest, there were some details watching this where I thought to myself, please, God, please let that be one of the things that actually happened. And the one that I have to ask you about is the kid trying to have his mom killed and paying for it with video games. Is that is that absolutely Absolutely true. true. And here's the difference, because it was originally written for Houston. So his line was, and I've heard these, I've seen all the evidence that they gathered. I've listened, I've watched the Sting, bad videos from the 90s of the Sting operations. I've listened to tapes and audio recordings. I've read transcripts. I really, I know as much about fake Hitman than anybody alive <laughs> who's not in that industry. Those couldn't have been good videos. No, they're really crappy. I'm sure they'd be much better now, you know. But um, that kid actually said, I know it's not much, but it's enough maybe for the toll roads. How Houston is that? That is such a Houston thing. And when we were doing wow. it in New Orleans, I said, oh, I got to lose that line. They don't really have toll roads here. I just said it's not, you know, I had to adjust that. That's so, if, honestly, if you'd said it in Chicago, because I'm talking to you from Chicago right now, you could have put that line back in. It, it would work, yeah. I went, I went from one toll road, toll road city to another. Uh, this might be... A bit of a, of a stretch of a comparison, but I, I, one of my favorite films of your entire career is Bernie. And obviously both have the, the connection of uh, Skip Holland's work, uh, you know, uh, work, and I feel like these two would make a really interesting sort of double feature. And I'm sort of curious if you as a filmmaker see any spiritual connection between Bernie and, and Gary Johnson. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they both originated as stories from kind of the the uh, true crime nose of Skip Hollinsworth and his own kind of sense of humor and his nose for characters and stuff. So, yeah, I think naturally they're in a they're in their own little phylum together, I would say. But, uh, yeah, I just like things that really happened, you know, and these real characters. So, yeah, I, th I think they're pretty close. It, it would be a good double feature. They're both I dark comedies, you know. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, I, I could watch, honestly a spin-off film on each of the uh, the Hitman alter ego. Like every time a new one was introduced, I, I felt like I could have spent two hours with that, that, that fake person. How deep did you and Glenn go into each one? Like how much more do you guys know about sort of the each sort of fake alter ego compared to what actually makes it onto the screen? That is true. Each one of those could be, yeah, in their own movie, you'd want to... Maybe we do a, one of those omnibus films, like each one gets like a 25 minute movie or, you know, Please. make a feature. Some great. Anyway, okay, we're working on it. But um, yeah, that was fascinating. You know, the real Gary Johnson did alter his appearance. He did do things to kind of customize the hitman to what he thought this person was, would appreciate, what they would think is a real hitman. We're in a unique area because it's all artifice, it's all fake. He's a fake hitman. This doesn't even exist, but we're creating it. So it gave us great leeway to kind of go out there. Um, what we show those characters is kind of more elaborate than what the Gary did. You know, Glenn Powell kind of went off the deep end a little bit here. And, uh, but, you know, we created these characters and they all, we cut a few at the script stage, but everything we filmed is in the movie. And that's a tribute to Glenn's hard work. And oftentimes we would rehearse them, you know, we would rehearse the scenes with the, the actors and Glenn was kind of working on accents and we had mock-ups of the looks of each of them and wardrobe, but it didn't really all come together because there's a lot of work in a lot of different areas until the day. So Glenn would step out of the van, you know, on set 
and just be the freak of the day kind of thing. He'd show up and everybody would just burst out laughing or just like, oh my God, who is this guy? And the one, the skeet shooting guy, he, we called him Tanner. He just, because we didn't have vans, we couldn't walk. He just walked, we had to walk to that location pretty far. And he was just walking up and I, I realized the crew didn't know who he was. Like they thought someone had a friend visiting or he had walked in from the area they a lot of them didn't recognize it as glenn that was pretty memorable so but um yeah all those guys are great but i give Grant glenn the uh, credit there for just you know he's reading books he was working on those accents he had accent coaches and you know on youtube doing things we we always thought that those could be created by him like an individual gary could create them nope no expensive prosthetics no one's in, he just kind of on his own could could create those you know, fake but, little scars and fake tattoos. You can; these are all kind of available at the consumer level. You know, there, there's an interesting transition though that happens as an audience member because you're right. When he gets out of the van, there is that initial shock, and you kind of laugh at it. But very quickly, it goes from "Oh my God, isn't that funny? Look, how, look, look what he looks like!" to "Oh no, this makes sense, and it's working." really really well like it starts out as a kind of a joke but it, it actually ends up being perfect i, I felt like I yeah thought it was the movie really fantastic consistently goes from funny to really dark and then you realize yeah. oh there's this sad desperate person who's who knows what's going on in their life but they might be going to prison now you know that's that's pretty bad too you know so i don't know there's a certain element of you could argue entrapment which the defense attorneys certainly do we see that in the movie a little bit so i don't know it's uh yeah it's Funny to dark pretty quickly. Yeah, um, I want to talk about the process of writing with an actor. Something that obviously you did here with Glenn, but but correct me if I'm wrong. You did with with Ethan and Julie on yeah. on the before films as well. What do you get out of that process? And and at, you know for each film, how do you decide whether or not an actor should have that kind of ownership over over not just their own character but just the story in general? It's just worked out that way. I'm gonna do that regardless. You know that's just part of my process. I'm gonna keep rewriting the script and keep finding the movie. Um, yeah, it was just natural in this case to ask Glenn, like we started down the road, we were talking about the article and how this would work as a movie and throwing around ideas. And it just sort of saves me a step. Same with Ethan and Jude. Like I could do a first draft, but I'm going to, we're going to process this in, in a workshop rehearsal atmosphere. I need to, cause I need it to be real. And I, I want, that kind of input, I want that, you know, to get to that next level, you know, I, I don't think actors, I think they're limited if they just hit their marks and say their lines, no matter how much personal work they've done. I'm, I'm trying to have it work in the whole. And this is such an intricately plotted and nuanced movie. We really need to ask all those questions and know where we were. And, you know, this is the kind of movie where you, the way they're being painted in a corner, we were often painted in a corner. It's like, oh, this now doesn't make any sense. You know, like, why would they be able to, you know, it was it was very plotty and had to be uh, finely tuned, you know. So you need a lot of people's brains. And actors, I found, they start asking questions that no executive or assistant director or anybody on the production side ever would. You know, they're like, well, if my character... If we did that two scenes ago, then why would I, I wouldn't think that, you know, it's like, oh, you know, people, I wrote this movie and I hadn't really thought of it. Once you get into those characters' points of view, he's like, oh yeah, that's a really good point. Why am I here? You know, why am, you know, so they start asking questions no one else catches, no matter, everyone thinks they know everything, but you can be on a set and an actor asks a question and just deflates the whole scene. It's like, yeah, this makes no sense that we're doing this because of this, that, and the other. So I like to have all those questions answered sitting around a table before there's a crew <laughs> waiting around. You know, I'm like, I do that for weeks. And just, again, it's the, I'm kind of rewriting the script and rehearsing at the same time. It's like a workshop thing. So anyway, it made total sense for me to jump in with Glenn at the script stage. And that never really ended. We just started incorporating, you know, incorporating Adria when she came aboard, you know, she just joined our team and, with her character and the whole thing, but everybody, the police, Reda, Sanjay, everybody else, they, they had, you know, enormous input into their characters. And we, we work up a lot of stuff. You know, we have a fun time. I'm trying to make a comedy and, you know, you get kind of smart, witty people together. Things get pretty funny. You know, I'm writing it down, you know, it's like, Oh, that's funny. And then 
hey, maybe we can work up that. So I don't know. To me, a film is a living, breathing thing that's coming into life. It's not, and of course, everyone doesn't work that way. A lot of films are finished in the filmmaker's head, whether they're storyboarded, and that that can be fantastic. You know, every Hitchcock film, there's really no room for the actors to, I mean, they're really, they're kind of fitting into the movie as structured because the movie doesn't have room for that. But if you're making a character-based film that lives or breathes with the charisma and the character of them, then I think it's pretty essential, you know, to have them comfortable and contributing and you want to feel real, you know? So I always get accused of like improv or something because they seem so real and I don't improv at all. We do that in rehearsal. We, we workshop, we come up with stuff, but I want the actor to feel like they own that character that they contributed and they're, they're confident and relaxed and can do their best on the day, you know? I love that. I'd love to know if, if you have a specific example over the course of your career, like what is the best, most interesting detail that came from your collaboration of having these moments with actors or someone added something that was so great that wouldn't have happened, wouldn't have been a part of the movie, wouldn't have been a part of the character if you didn't have that kind of collaboration with the actors the way you do? Oh, I think it's essential to be up for it. I mean, what I just said, actors start asking questions like, I'm going back 30 years to, you know, plus to Dazed and Confused. The three people in the car, Mike, Tony, and Cynthia, they're in the station wagon driving around. And I think Adam Goldberg looked at me and says, well, we're at the Moon Tower, but how would we know about the party? If we're not at the Emporium, like, how would we know about the party? And I'm like, wow, no one's ever asked that question. How would you know about the party? You're not in the swirl of how would you don't just show up. I, I went like, that's a real thing. Meanwhile, Matthew McConaughey, who hadn't started yet, was going through a fitting that day. He had just come out with his wardrobe and because he starts next week, you know, but he came in and, you know, it's the sun's still out. We're shooting at night. But, you know, we're talking. I said, hey, Matthew, I'm thinking about we're going to get a shot of you driving around. But, hey, I'm thinking about a scene where you pull up and maybe and I had my sister in my ear. She was my assistant because I just love Cynthia's character, you know, Marissa Rubisi's so cute with her red hair. I just love her, but she doesn't have any guys. She's with these two guys who, but she doesn't have a love interest. What if, what if like Matthew flirted with her? Wouldn't that be fun? She seems like she deserves that. I said, yeah, she's so cute. And so she was in my one ear and then Matthew's in my other. And I was like, hey, Matthew, so we'll drive up. And the goal of this scene, you got to tell them that there's a party. Just inform them about the party and they'll get there there. But then you can also kind of flirt with her. Something about the red hair, like, she's new to you. She hasn't caught your eye, but she's just another high school girl. A little different. And suddenly, and suddenly you got a thing for, you know, a little thing with her. She's tonight's little flirtation. And so he loved that. So I was going back in between, but he's not even scheduled to work. But we get this. So we just work this scene up really spontaneously over the hours. Like, say that was 5 o'clock. By midnight, we're shooting it. And I have a producer who's kind of angry because I'm going off. He likes the script a lot and thinks I'm just jerking around. He even leaves and goes home. But that's when Matthew pulled up and said that, all right, all right, all right line. That all kind of came out of that six hour. Um, but selfish filmmaker, I'm solving a problem. Filmmaking is problem solving. I've got a problem that my actors don't know. how. It doesn't, you know, I don't want... Some audience member, wait, how would they know how to get out? That doesn't make it, you know, I hate coming out of a movie and go, well, wait a second, how did that, I don't believe any of this. You know, so you're trying to always keep it tight. But that's, that's one example of something that happened like that. So, you know, that's, that's not uncommon. But again, that's cutting it a little close to me. I don't want to do that on the day. I'd like to do that a month in advance, three weeks in advance, and keep working on the, keep working Dude. on the script, you know. You have no idea how much I love that story. Thank you for telling me it that, is, man. Yeah, that was but awesome. that's pretty illustrative, I guess. No, that was that was awesome. Um, I want to go back. You, you touched on on the chemistry between actors, and I've got to say, you know, between this film, which I'm, I'm not blowing smoke. My God, the chemistry on this film is unbelievable. And obviously, uh, you know, the, the the before trilogy the, between you know Ethan and Julie. I'm sort of curious, what are the tells for you that indicate this is going to work between these two? Like, do different different sort of examples of on-screen chemistry in your different films have any commonalities where early on you go, ah, I see, I see that. And because I see that, I know it's going to work. 
Yeah, well, as a director, you have the front row seat. You see it long before anybody else in in auditions or in callbacks or rehearsals, certainly. But, uh, you know, chemistry is funny. It's like you can't really create it. It's either there or it isn't, just like charisma, you know. And yet you can nurture it. You can let it express itself and maximize it, you know. I mean, I knew Glenn and Audria both have this charisma and this energy. So I met Audria first just via Zoom. I mean, that part is so important for the movie. We don't have a movie if she doesn't, you know, you know, can take that to some level and be believable. Some guy who would just give up everything <laughs> to be with her. And, you know, she fits that bill. But I had Every met her. Every guy watched this movie and went, oh, no, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you can't, yeah. you have to be able to go, oh, yeah the, the, yeah, the guy would give up everything he's worked for to be with her. Makes sense, right? Yeah. You know, there's, there's few in that category, but when they're there, they're <laughs> there, you know. It's like every guy knows yeah. that. Yeah. So <laughs> she's that to him. But I wanted them to get together. I said, well, Glenn, I, I don't want to oversell her, but I think we have our Madison. And then they, you know, a few days later, they met. And uh, I just wanted to hear how they did. I mean, I knew what they had. But then I got a call later, like five hours after I thought I'd be getting a call. It's like, oh, yeah, we, we, we met for one hour, but we ended up being five hours. You know, we just hit it off, talking about our lives. We started, they tell a funny story. It was dry, dry January or something. Is mm -hmm. that a tradition? I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing. I don't do it, but I hear other people do. That sounds terrible. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, they said, oh, well, they got a tequila. And by the end of the night, they were just, I'm like, okay, that's all I needed to hear. I didn't need to see them next to each other. I knew that. I knew that. Other movies, like Julian Ethan, I had pretty extensive callbacks. I wanted to see them together. I wanted to work with them in rehearsal and feel like that that chemistry, it's not just chemistry, but I'm testing their brains. Can they, can they work on this? Can they, you know, help me achieve what I'm trying to with the film? How, yeah. The bottom line is you just, to, to me, the best start is like really smart, really funny, and a hardworking, that's a, that's a good start. Yeah. And collaborative, a good teammate, you know, not a, yeah. not a diva. Yeah. Um, I, whenever I interview a, a legendary filmmaker who, who I look up to, who I respect, I always do this thing where I look back over the filmography to see if there's any like big anniversary that I should be bringing. Oh, it's the 30th anniversary of this. And you have a really interesting one because 2024 is the 30th anniversary of nothing. In 93, you had Dazed and Confused, and then in 95, you had Before Sunrise. So what I'd love to ask you about is 94, that year in between. You just came off Dazed. It's right before launching this iconic trilogy. I'd love to know what that year was like for you. You didn't have a movie in that year, but you had to, that had to be such an interesting well, time in your career. I was gearing up to shoot. We shot Before Sunrise in Vienna that summer. So I headed over there in June, but I spent the first half of that year casting rewriting the script. So that year was production, and then we premiered it in early 95. So, you know, that so was... It's still, it's kind of the 30th anniversary of it, in a way, if you're, if you're a purist. Well, yeah. I mean, when I think of an anniversary, I would think 10 years ago, because I'm going, 30th anniversary, I even talked to Ethan the other day, I said, hey, 30 years ago, about now, we were heading over, I was heading over to Vienna to make this movie. You came over a little bit later, but... That's been 30 years. Isn't that crazy? So we're, the, the personal anniversary isn't when it came out, which can be kind of abstract and not of your own making, but when you shot it. So Glenn Powell, we realized we're coming up on our 10-year anniversary of shooting Everybody Wants Some. We shot that in the fall, fall of 14. So, yeah. And I, it didn't come out until the very first time I ever interviewed him here in Chicago for that. You guys went on a tour for that. Yeah, yeah. That was wow. That was fantastic. Yeah, but wait, twenty four. I think Boyhood came out in fourteen, so I would mm -hmm. have a ten year. So anyway, but we're not doing ten years. We're not doing ten year yeah. anniversary. Yeah, ten, ten, ten is the one where I go like, ah, I mean, that's like a real like if I really want to stretch it a little too um, early. As, as a movie nerd, I would love to sort of talk about um, just get, to get your perspective on that, that period of the 90s where you and Quentin Tarantino and Kevin Smith all sort of all were sort of coming out at one time. I'm just sort of curious, what, what do you remember about all of you guys sort of breaking out together? And, and 
can that sort of thing happen again or was that a product of, of, a, of a moment in time that can't be replicated? Well, there's so many. You mentioned three filmmakers, but there's so many more you can throw in there. You know, Soderbergh was was really getting going. You know, he was there a little earlier, but yeah, so many, so many first and second films, kind of through the '90s. And I just think it was kind of the last time the studio system, as we knew it, was taking chances. You know, that they would kind of give an indie filmmaker who you know maybe you give them a chance throw some little bit of money at them let them make a movie and you know like i got that opportunity on days the same way like spike lee had made an indie film but then oh you got a film that maybe could be a little more mainstream here's six million you know go do that but a lot of a lot of filmmakers i mean and miramax did a lot of those films and they weren't seen as a studio but they were a studio think of them as a studio you know given someone like quentin whatever it was, eight or 10 million to make his film, you know? So it, it was a good era. Looking back, it becomes some kind of halcyon great era. But when you're in it, you're just struggling and complaining about what's not happening <laughs> to your satisfaction. But no, looking back, it was kind of, it was kind of great. You know, I feel bad meeting young filmmakers now. Oh, any advice? I say, yeah, be born 30 years ago, you know, yeah. dude, it's, <laughs> It was a it was a good time, but you never know that it's it's the last of an era. And I, I just think the studios changed. You know, they're just not in the business of adult entertainment really. They don't really make films about adults so much anymore. And they don't uh take those chances on young talent. I think just the economics w- rule that it started to cost so much to release a movie. Like when I made certain movies it was like oh only a 2.3 million like before sunrise oh 2.3 million thing oh we can't lose money because dvds cable well even if it doesn't do that well theatrically we can't we're not in the business of breaking even but we won't lose so there was an assurance there but that all kind of went away at some point dvds quit selling cable i don't know what the deals you know so you're always dealing with industry volatility based on their own financial insecurity you know, so we're all products of that. But yeah, it wasn't that much later, like 2008, when I'm trying to get like Bernie made, I'm like, wait a second, I got Jack Black, Matthew McConaughey, Shirley MacLaine, and I got I to gotta shoot this in 22 days on, you know, a few million bucks. Yeah, you know, like nobody, it's like the uh, the financial crisis it hit, there's no money, you know, you, know, you hit these dry patches. So what are you going to do? I mean, I want to make movies, so I'll just... I'll make that movie, even with the uncertainties, not having a distributor, you know, whatever you got to piece together. I mean, we did Hitman like that. We didn't have a distributor. The industry passed on it. No one wanted to do it. Glenn and I believed in ourselves and we got lucky, Stuart Ford, and, you know, was able to piece together financing internationally with some, inv- you know, whatever. We, we got, someone believed in it enough, but it wasn't a studio or a a distributor or anything so well obviously we ended up you know being the beneficiaries of of what happened um i'm gonna cut you loose on this because they're gonna cut me out of this oh. um jack black has been has been very vocal about wanting to do a, a school of walks school of rock sequel but he's also admitted that you would have to come back and mike white would have to come back but you know i hear that's that's one of my favorite movies of all time but i i can't figure out like what the story there would be be like like do you do you can can you envision it i'm not i'm not even asking you to tell me what it is but like is is yeah, there another I mean, story there 20 years is a long time you know i mean those kids are in their 30s now so i you know i don't know what it would be but i think what jack's really saying there it would be fun for mike and rick and jack to get together and do something kind of fun like that but yeah i don't really know what it would be there was talk of it a long time ago too but it it didn't you know that's kind of touchy, you know. I don't, I don't think you want to do a film just to do a film, you know. You, you know, you want to have a great idea and a great story and a purpose. So, I think most sequels yeah. start to stumble because they're just kind of, you know, economic generators or something. So I've avoided that, you know. Even on the before trilogy, every time we're doing those, we're like, as we're doing the second one, we're like, oh, this is the lowest grossing film to ever spawn a sequel. <laughs> it's like, was it was it actually? Yeah, we think so. What? Well, I mean, but that's that's interesting because all all three of those films feel so necessary, though. Like, it feels like you can't watch the first one without watching yeah, two and three. And yet, no one wanted them at the time. And like, they're just not six. The industry could care less. 
But, you know, we, me, Julie, and Ethan, we thought we had a story to tell. So I think that's what you live by is you having a story to tell that seems worthwhile. And every now and then the world lines up and agrees with you, but not always. Yeah. Well, that's, I've never really understood whenever I see people online say, well, like, who, no, no one asked for this movie. Who asked for this movie? And I always think, like, most of the greatest movies of all time, no one asked for. Well, who asked for an album or who asked for a painting or a sculpture or a novel? No one has to ask for anything. Someone's got to be just trying to express themselves in the world. We're all sending out little signals in our own ways. So you should be grateful. No one asked for You don't have to consume it. You know, exactly. Exactly right. It's exactly not floating right. your boat. There's a lot of other stuff to be doing in the world. So, you know, whatever. That's that's kind of silly. Well, you mentioned being grateful. I am grateful for this conversation. So you can't tell I'm just such a massive fan. And you're such a big reason of, of my of the reason I love movies and the reason I, I pursued this this profession. So I truly did. Uh, well, that's this flattering. And I, yeah. Thanks so much. And it means a lot man. hearing it from a a Houston guy, you know. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, man. Talk to you soon. All, All right. right. Nice talking with you. Thank you very much to our good friends at Netflix for giving us some time with uh, Richard Link later. Uh, Jakey, handle those, handling those solo are tough. How did the mm -hmm. conversation flow? But yeah, I mean, luckily it's 30 minutes with a guy who, you know, I all all four of us in this uh, podcast could have handled 30 minutes with him solo. That's right. that's just the kind of career he has, you know, and a huge portion of the interview was about Hitman. But he was, as you could see, able to just talk about so much of his stuff. And you know what's crazy is that Richard Linklater has one of those careers where like for every movie of his that is iconic and classic, he has a lot of really great movies that you kind of forget that he directed. Like he did a really mm -hmm. good movie with Zac Efron about Orson Welles called me and Orson Welles that I, I really like that no one talks about. And, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Bernie with Jack Black and Shirley MacLaine, uh, like, that's a great movie. So we talked a lot about sort of the comparison, you know, sort of that true, both, both of those movies were based on articles, you know, about, about these sort of Southern guys and, and uh, yeah, so, you know, he's he's one of those guys that you can talk with for a long time. And at the end of the day, just feels like a very low key film fan who would fit right into a podcast like this. But I got to okay. say, and, and you everyone here has experienced this, so it's not an, you know, an anomaly in that sense. But um, the moment when a interview ends and you get a text message from the studio going like holy shit that one story he told was insane and and oh, if you nice. just listen to the interview it's the story he told uh about how he just kind of stumbled into the all right all right all right moment with matthew yeah. mcconaughey and just it's just kind of a reminder of as tom hanks once told us on this podcast we're just making shit up yeah. You know, and, and you, you have no control over when you sort of stumble into greatness. And and there are so many moments that we know and love and cherish and have quoted a thousand times. And I think it's funny to remember that on the day for most of them, it was just it was just another day. You know, how yeah. you, you, you always try to ask the actors about the, these lines or that moment. And they always tell you, you never know. You, you, you never know on the day when if that that line's going to be something or if this line's going to be something. So, um, yeah, he, this is. I've, yeah, we got 30 minutes with him. All of you guys could have done 30 minutes with him easily. And, uh, I, you know, I think we collectively probably could have gone another hour with the guy and still still barely scraped his entire filmography. So I want to talk about Hitman a bit sure. because it's a movie that played some of the film festivals last year and, and got an enormous amount of buzz. With some people going on the record as saying, like, best movie I've seen in years. Yeah. Um. And I think it's a perfectly fine movie. I think it's it's cute. You know, it's it's got a dark side to it a little bit. For, just to give you guys the log line for people who don't know at all what Hitman is. Um, Glenn Powell is this mild mannered dude um, who works for is it the is it the FBI or just the local law enforcement? Well, um, he's he's a like a professor at a local small university in New Orleans and then yeah. has a side job. Uh, working, yeah, for the for the FBI or the CIA or something like that for like a local the local the na local branch of a national law enforcement where they essentially will send people into these situations and Glenn Powell like helps to record them, get their confessionals. Mm -hmm. And one time when they're not able to send the person and they normally send in, 
they have to send in somebody who the person who they're meeting with has never met before. And they send Glenn Powell in. Right. And they realize that he's really good at playing yeah. this aspect of it. Yeah. And to pretend to be a hitman because they basically need to get it's for people who are trying to have someone in their life murdered. So they yeah. basically get someone to pretend to be a hitman so that they can be wired up and get this person to confess. Yes, I'm planning on ha- having my husband, my wife, my whatever murdered. And so he really rolls with it. Like he yeah. keeps coming up with these different identities that he can play in the meetings and it's a perfect acting showcase because mm. it allows him to to play off these different personalities that he's creating. And I thought all that was fine, um, but it, it, it didn't go in, in, in any places that I was like ready to be sort of blown away by it. Right. Like, like ultimately, when it all played out, it's like, eh, it's kind of what I thought it was going to be. You know, and that was it was it was fun. I enjoyed it, but didn't really blow me away. I am with you 100 percent. And what I thought was interesting was. For like the first 40 minutes or so, I was actually really into it. When the movie is just about him, his involvement with the FBI, and the fact that he doesn't, he's not just good at pretending to be a hitman in these scenarios, he creates different characters based on each individual scenario. And it's really impressive and oftentimes very funny, these wild and crazy characters that he comes up with. But if you'll remember in the interview that we just had with with uh, Linklater, he said that basically the, the true story stops about 40 minutes in because it basically mm. uh, at one point he talked a, a woman out of doing it out of out of you know and so basically glenn and richard linklater came up with this idea of well what if he ran into her again he would have to keep up this facade of being this hitman and what if she were just the most beautiful woman in the world and he fell for her and she didn't fall for the real him she fell for a hitman him right and funny enough once the real story stopped and sort of their hypothetical what if version of the story took over is honestly where i lost interest Okay. I was super into it up until the hypothetical. And I, and I had no idea that that's where, you know, I I knew that uh, to some degree, and they say right off the top of the movie, some of this is based on a true story. Some of this is not. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, but I didn't realize that it was all true up to a moment, but I just found it very funny that ironically, that moment is kind of where I checked out and sort of went. um, But I, I am with you. I pressed play sort of wondering oh i wonder where on my top 10 list this is gonna fall and it's yeah it's a it's a per i honestly and and i've seen a lot of people talk about oh it's such a shame that this isn't going to theaters it would be a massive hit and i'm not so sure it would be i'm not so sure it would be this big massive hit i honestly like i kind of feel like it's a perfectly fine movie to watch on netflix which i feel like is blasphemy right now but that's that's honestly how i felt about it you know, it's not blasphemy. Kev, you and I were having this conversation yesterday about mm. Beverly Hills Cop 4. Right. And how that's going right to Netflix. And if it were going to theaters, I I mentioned that if that movie were going to theaters, I thought it would do pretty well. I thought, I, thought people would, uh, I do, too. Would, would have like an interest in going out mm. of the way to see that franchise back in theaters. And a guy, a um, friend of ours named Travis Hobson, um, who does Junkets as well, too. He was like, oh, I totally disagree. Like that. It just feels like it's a Netflix movie. And Hitman to me feels like a Netflix movie. And I think a lot of things that are out like right now that we're having this conversation, like so many things that I've sat down to watch recently have been fine. Like they've been fine. This summer but as a whole, I think has been fine. Where are the movies that are like, like demanding our attention? Right. Well, like that's I everyone keeps, you know, I know everyone is, you know, uh, being chicken little and talking about the sky is falling because of the box office. But like what I keep pointing to is like, there's nothing great in the like I liked apes quite a bit and apes is doing well, but also keep in mind, we're still feeling the residual effects of the actors and the writer strike. Sure. Like, yeah, like yeah. had the actors and the writer strike not happened, we would have uh, a mission movie coming out this summer. Deadpool right. Wolverine would have opened up the summer. It would have been the first movie because keep in mind, Deadpool Wolverine pushed back to July and that's when fall guy slid in. Okay. So if, if it had it not been for the strikes, we, we probably would already have a movie that's well on its way to a billion dollars by now. OK, so instead, we got to wait till July for that to happen. But yeah. in the meantime, it's like bad I mean, boys could bad boys could open to 50. They're talking about yeah. potentially. Yeah, I figured which would somewhere be a in big the 40s. Win. Yeah, I figured That'd be a 40s. big win for that movie yeah. if it opens. Yeah. What, um, what else is going to do? I mean, Inside Out will be big. 
I assume it's going to be big just because families are looking for something yeah. to go to. Like both and that and Despicable Me will make yeah. quietly a lot of yeah. money. But um, I mean, also keep in mind, look at uh, one Garfield went back up to the number one spot. But if has been holding strong, like I know it didn't have a great opening, but I don't know. If, I don't know if you've been watching if week for week, like like 30 percent drop offs every week. It's doing very well. Have either of you guys seen if mm, I saw it? You saw it. Mm-hmm. And but I liked it. I liked it. It's um, it's much heavier than I thought it was going to be. I think it, I think it's a little too heavy for small kids, and I think it's a little too childish for adults. So I'm not quite sure where it falls. But um, I also was having a bad day that day whenever I saw it. If I'm being honest with you, and and I think we always have to be honest about where our heads are at when we see sure. movies. And so yeah. it's it's hard for me to give that a, a fair shake, knowing that I, I was having a bad day. What about Quiet Place? Do you think Quiet Place could do could do well? I I, I can be honest with you. I keep forgetting that movie's coming out. Like I, I'm excited yeah. to see it, and I know we have the junket coming up. But like I I have to keep reminding myself. Oh, that's right. There's a Quiet Place movie coming out. Kev, where's your anticipation level for for that film? I mean, it's so interesting. Like I was texting with the guys last night, and I'm still Clint Eastwood in this interview. Um, <laughs> this, this, <laughs> um, I didn't have lunch. Um, in my opinion, there's just not really anything exciting coming out that I'm genuinely excited about until Deadpool Wolverine. Um, yeah. I know we were discussing that just now. And, and the fall guy, am I surprised those, those didn't do as well? I know ifs holding as Jake just mentioned, but quiet place. I have really no desire to see it. I, I don't feel any need to know that part of the story. It feels Again, like it takes out what made a quiet place kind of special. It's like, okay, well this is the movie that it skipped in order to get right. to the good yeah. stuff. And, and it, it was it, cool that it skipped it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's basically ex- exposition, the movie. Yeah, and, it, and honestly, it, it feels a little bit like John Krasinski, like John Krasinski and Emily Blunt are busy right now, but we really <laughs> want to keep this franchise going. Well, and, you know, mm-hmm. it could be good. Like, I think there, you know, it, it's possible to take the concept yeah. of A Quiet Place and then put a good horror movie. In well, that also, concept, yeah, because well, the whole idea of like a a monster that goes based, you have to be quiet and then setting the story in the loudest city in America. Yeah. Like, that's that's a that's, that's a cool. Hook. And what I don't want is like to, to uh, what Kevin's getting at is exposition. In the movie, I yeah, don't really want this agree, movie to yeah. be like to end and be like now i understand everything yeah i don't want to know where they're from i don't i agree with you 100 but kevin you also said you're not super into uh alien which is my most anticipated yeah i mean i I don't know i I was texting with the guys last night about this like and they were going back and forth about this new alien film and i'm I'm excited by the filmmaker Mm -hmm. um but i'm just not really i don't know i and i love prometheus but i'm just not you know i'm not really in the mood or i'm not really in the mindset of like oh i can't wait for another alien film And did you watch the trailer? I I have not watched the trailer. So I'm kind of I'm going to I'm trying to stay away from trailers nowadays. As I get as I get older, I kind of would like to just experience films uh, as it is because there's a there's an expectation that comes with trailers that I have. I find to be uh, uh, unfair to the product the filmmaker ended up trying to make because you go into a film and you're watching it like what was the movie I watched the other day? Oh, The Strangers. I saw the new Strangers movie. I I knew every beat of that film before mm. the before I walked into that theater. I knew when the axe was coming through the door. I knew when this was going to happen. I knew when the knock was going to happen. I knew yep. exactly where every beat was going to happen. And even though it kind of does follow the original Strangers as well, so that's kind of another problem the film had. It, it, it this is Renny Harlan's movie, who we had on the show. If you want to listen to it, um, <laughs> it's a bad plug, but I mean, I, 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 it's not. <laughs> it's so it's predictable. Not necessi- yeah, I'm not necessarily like he you know, was it, great. It, it's just a marketing thing, to be honest with you. Um, I, w- I would like for Alien to surprise me. Um, the movie I'm most excited to see between now and the end of the summer outside Deadpool is Bad Boys. Um, and I'm a huge Bad Boys fan. And Sean and we talk about this all the time. We're obsessed with the franchise. They they're It's being made by two fans who really elevated and brought the Michael Bay formula into three, but also made their own film. The Panagliano stuff was really emotional. I thought three just did a really great job. The action was fantastic. I just want a bad boys two level style film again. Like just I I don't care if it's four hours of just Martin Lawrence and Will Smith doing jokes, killing bad guys. I mean, I just want that vibe. Like Their chemistry, their friendship, their banter, that back and forth, that comedy Um, to be. I'm, I'm excited to go to the movies tomorrow night, get a popcorn mixed icy with blue and red some Sour Patch Kids and just sit there and I want to be blown away for two and a half hours by action and comedy. And I, and I know yeah. exactly what they're going to deliver and I can't wait for it. Like that to me well, feels like you're asking where the movies are that we want to see and, and, and the movies that are intriguing us go to the box office. 
outside of the Will Smith controversy and what happened at the Oscars, you know, I, I think people are starting to return to wanting to see him back on the big screen. I saw an article yeah. about that the other day, and, I'm, I, and I think I just want a good action movie. That's kind of where I, that's kind of where I'm at. But last night we were having a conversation about things being too familiar. And you're right. I mean, you were bringing up the Aliens trailer and the idea of another Aliens franchise. I'm as excited for Bad Boys as you are, too. It is still part four in an ongoing saga. Um you know, so far we've been treated to a lot of sequels. A Apes is again. But, but what I think Apes did well and what I think we're going to transition into the Acolyte really briefly because it dropped two episodes is inside of these umbrellas of of worlds and franchises. You have to start doing something else that's different and creative. And and part of the reason I think Jake is going to agree with me on this one, why I like the Acolyte as much as I do. And we're only going to talk about the two first two episodes. We've been, been lucky enough to see four, but we'll hold off on any kind of spoilers is really just it's set 100 years before the events of Phantom Menace. This is revealed in the title card in the very beginning. Um, and because it's set in the High Republic and because it's all new characters um, and you're not sitting around waiting for, oh, there's the guys that I know, um, I was able to just click into it as a new. It didn't even really matter that it was Star Wars. It was just new characters with new threats um, new backstories, new interesting mythology. Yes, it involved lightsabers and, and Jedi and, and terms like that that I'm really familiar with. But I found it to be really engaging because it was telling a story that was completely fresh while still being inside the Star Wars universe. And so if we're going to be relegated to these franchises that are going to keep recycling, like you're going to have to get another alien movie because we need it. You're going to have to get another Quiet Place movie because it's time for another one. I want storytellers who step into those brands and and think of different ways to tell stories with them. And, and that, to me, Jake, is a big reason why I thought The Acolyte was was really entertaining. And, I, I, you know, that's why I can't wait to see where where the series goes from there. Yeah. You know, uh, I was in a situation where, you know, like you said, we were given the first four and we had to watch them for not had, had to sounds douchey, but we had to for for work purposes. We had, to, you know, and, and, you know, I have been honest in that, like, I really haven't cared for uh, a majority of the uh, Disney Plus series. I was not a fan mm -hmm. of Ahsoka. Um, I thought the last season of Mando was was really weak. I loved Andor. And I think Acolyte leans more and or um, not just because uh, when possible, it seemed like they really filmed on location, which I think adds such uh, a massive element to it but you're right they they by not setting the story within the confines uh, or the prison of between it being between episodes one through nine they're yeah. not sort of jailed or tethered to these responsibilities of having to stay within a certain story it's you know it's not like a well you know here's 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 a story that's adjacent to the story that you know so that way you get excited when we can give you little hints but also we're not able to veer too far away because we can't do anything that messes with the main this sure, can do yeah, yeah. whatever they want to do which is what we've been saying on this podcast for years which is that in a galaxy far far away a long time ago why are you telling stories within a 100 year span like, right. go nuts. Tell me a story 10,000 years before Skywalker. Tell me a story 10,000 years after Skywalker. Like, sure. go crazy. And look, I'll start with 100 years. 100 years is not, you know, it's not huge, but we'll get there. And it presents a lot of really interesting ideas um, that... You know, it brings in uh, witches and, and, and it presents ideas that like maybe the Jedi aren't infallible. And it's just sort of mm -hmm. like, OK, now you're talking. Now you're bringing in some stuff. And I and I don't have to sit there and worry about when's when's uh, when's the, the cameo from a de-aged de Luke Skywalker is going to show up <laughs> like we can just enjoy a fresh, good, unique Star Wars story that honestly uh when they only gave us the first four, so we've got to wait a couple of weeks till we can sort of wait for the show to catch up. But when that fourth episode ended, I think I literally screamed out the F word because I knew I had yeah. to wait, you know, however long from the screeners plus however long till till we catch up to five. But it's, it's a strong it fish. How long has it been since that? So you had that. Oh, it's been it's been a while. It's been yeah. it's been a long while. I had a guy scream out the F word at the end of a Star Wars story, but it was because of something. <laughs> 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 they fly now <laughs> yeah exactly they all also right, so do other things now like fart now <laughs> uh we are not gonna be able to touch on every single thing that we uh didn't get to over the <clears throat> past couple of weeks but we did want to 
take a second um, before jumping to a quick ad break to just highlight a couple of things that have been on our radar um, and recommend some things to you, or at least steer you in a different direction, because that is sort of the point of the show. Um, and while most of the things that I would probably send you to is is television related, I'm very excited mm-hmm. for the bear. Uh, yes. Sean, I finally watched the bear and caught up on that Best show on TV, um, baby. The movie that I watched uh, in the past couple of weeks just for shits and giggles and had such a good time with it was unfrosted. Dude, thank you. You know, you and I are the only ones. Are we really? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like. <laughs> Well, I, I wish I, I wish it was frosted because I don't like unfrosted uh, pop tarts and frosted <laughs> is better. If that movie had been frosted, I think I would have liked it more. I thought it was funny, man. I thought it's, the bit. I thought the bit ran out. That's, it does. That's my whole thing. Yeah, it does. But it's stupid. Like it's a stupid movie. Yes, and it knows it's a stupid movie. But it's one of those things where it moves so quickly, and there's just another funny person coming on. Yeah. You know every five minutes yeah that i just laughed my way through it like, dude those I those i don't want to say who it is but those actors reprising their iconic emmy winning tv oh, characters yes. fantastic like, come on like that's I, I, that's a i will say hugh grant as tony the tiger was uh something i was i, I needed in my life I, I i just need i needed him saying they're great in the in the costume i just i just rewatched notting hill and i'm like this guy's come a long way <laughs> i i admire it fe- in a way it felt that i'm believe me in no way am i putting it on the platform of airplane but it reminded sure. me of that pattern I get what you're saying yeah where it was just joke 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 like some missed but if yeah. it missed it didn't stay long yeah. enough because the you next one on. was right behind it yeah and it was another idiot person coming I in i thought it know, was funny, really man. funny i really bit. did Good. I'm glad to hear that because we hadn't talked about it. Yeah, I'm finding myself. I didn't even know you watched it. I'm finding myself defending it. Like everyone in my newsroom is talking about how like it's one of the worst movies they've ever seen. And I'm like, well, OK, come on. Whenever people tell me I'm, that, I always go, you know, you haven't watched enough movies. No, that's if, if that's one of the worst movies you've ever seen. You should watch more movies. And there's nothing special about it. It's not no, like I'm not Jerry saying it's great. It's not, not going to be the yeah. hell out of it. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not going to be on my top 10 list or anything. But like, no, I had a really good time with it. I enjoyed it. Good. OK, I'm glad to hear that because I I wasn't quite sure where everybody else fell. And the only thing I'd really heard about it is negative stuff. Yeah. But, um, I thought Gaffigan was really funny. Yeah. And uh, and everyone like understood the bit. Absolutely. Yeah. And play, they played it seriously, even yeah. though it very clearly yeah. was tongue in cheek. Yeah. So if you need just a, something to you know put on to pass 90 minutes. Yeah. And, and get a couple of laughs out of it. I recommend on Frosted. Uh, Jake's pick is a movie that I have a screener of. And haven't brought myself to watch yet, but I'm really intrigued by it. Um, it's called In a Violent Nature. And um, but but Jake may throw cold water on it. How yeah, you- I, I, I was so bummed because I really wanted to like this movie because the premise is so fantastic. It's basically imagine uh, watching a Friday the 13th movie, not not even Friday the 13th. Like like imagine imagine it's Friday the 13th part three, but mm-hmm. you're watching it. We're, instead of the cameras mostly being with like the high with the camp counselors and then Jason occasionally pops in. What if the camera just stayed with Jason the whole time? But that sounds amazing. It sounds amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't do anything interesting with the premise other than just kind of follow him around. And there are some interesting perspectives, but like it's a really wasted missed opportunity. Like the, mm-hmm. like at the end of the day, that, that that premise doesn't mean a damn thing unless you're also going to make a good slasher movie. And it's not okay. that great of us. I mean, it, whenever I say it feels like a Friday the 13th sequel, I mean, because at one point, one of his victims says to him, like, you know, do you remember me when you came back from the dead 10 years ago? Like I like, you know, we fought each other. So like it very much implies that this has happened before and that this has kind of been this is a thing that he does. And like like he's Jason. He's, he finds his mask halfway through very much like how, you know, because, you know, Jason doesn't find the hockey mask till part three. So very sure, much, yeah. you know, so it's I, I was kind of like like within the first 20 minutes, I was like, all right, I'm in. Let's go. Let's do this. And then like 30 minutes later, I was like, oh, this is it. This is now granted, like some of the some of the kills are pretty cool. Okay. Um, but it's nothing more iconic or and definitely nothing more violent than a terrifier movie. Um, all the reports of like someone threw up or fainted in one of the screenings or something. I saw a headline that when it was like that, that someone like throws up in, in a violent nature screening. Someone goes, how come like in the, the, the violent movies, there's always someone that throws up. Is it just the same guy? 
that just throws up <laughs> in all these screenings. Um, so, uh, so yeah. By the so, way, no. I said to mention this real quick. Yeah. I had never seen a Terrifier film before. And did, you, did you watch one? I did not, but I put on a scene because it was recommended to me in Terrifier Two. Which one? That, it was a scene in a bedroom with the clown and he's ripping apart this girl and the mom comes home and then the mom goes upstairs and the girl like still can talk to her. It's one of the most disgusting, brutal. (laughs) I don't, I will never, ever, ever watch those movies. You've never seen the hacksaw scene from, uh, from part one. I don't want to, I I, I don't like, it was just uncomfortably gross. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I know those movies do well and people like them. Um, I yeah, just, just don't your, find that just entertaining. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Just it's just not my thing. I don't yeah. know those movies. What are they? What's the hook? hook of, are they like the hostile? Art, Art, Art like the clown. So basically it's, it's, uh, it started as like kind of like in game. You might know the history more like, a started as kind of a word of mouth horror film about this, uh, you don't really know much about the killer. His name, Art, his name is Art the Clown. He's yeah. a guy who's dressed up like a clown. And uh, Art, I that's mean, such a not terrifying Art, name. Yeah. <laughs> but and, and the thing is, is that like they're also they're also kind of like he's kind of funny. Like yeah. he's kind of like jokey, 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 jokey. Like at one point, like you know, when the second one takes place on Halloween, and he's like kind of stalking the girl like through a, um, a Halloween costume shop, and she keeps looking at him, and he keeps putting on like different like joke glasses, and at one, <laughs> at one point she looks over at him, and he has these big sun like sunflower sun- sunglasses on, and he just. <laughs> It's the it's stupidest sounds, thing. It but then hilarious. It's really funny. But then on the flip side of it, it's not funny. When he Trust goes, me. when he goes full blown killer, the kills are are famously or maybe infamously overly gra- like 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 I, I consider myself like I can watch I can watch some stuff right like I, I, sure, I watch yeah. to the point where I go like ugh 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 okay. but. It's, they're just ridiculous. I I, th- I think for me that's yeah. that's that's kind of how I get past what Kevin's talking about, like the the brutality of it all. Just because like the the, the ridiculous nature of just how violent they are, it almost it sounds weird. It almost becomes comical because it's just like this is just so insanely ridiculous. But I, okay. I enjoy them. And a third one's coming out um, uh, this this Halloween. Terrifier. They're Terrifier. Called? Terrifier. Yeah. All right. So you recommend those over in a violent nature. Oh, but God, I still yeah. want to. I'm going to call up in a violent I'm, nature. Watch it. Watch it. And let me know what you think. I um, and then. Well, I'll, I'll Sean, talk about do not do not watch it. Do not watch Terrifier. Uh, if you want to uh, move through your day without anxiety. and well, feeling I would, okay, uh, I would say don't don't not watch it. I would say just watch a trailer and see if you if it's. Have you seen a game? No, no. It, it's something that I might it's, watch if like a group of friends want to watch it, but it's not something I want to watch by myself. It's Sean, just, it feels like just a so just brutal. watch it, baby. Oh, they, they, no. they call it the unfrosted of horror movies. It's like it's like it's like watching <laughs> Human Centipede. No, oh, yes, it is. no, it's not, no that's what it feels no, like. Not. No, no. <laughs> that's a very I, different type I, of horror. I'm going to say strong disagree on that. I, I, oh. I do. I will clarify. I have never seen a Terrifier film all the way through. There you go. But the scene that I did watch. Reminded me why I will never watch another Terrifier film all the you way know, through. You know what is coming to uh, streaming that I never got a chance to see is Monkey Man. I think Monkey Man is going to be. Oh, out next Monkey Man's good. Awesome. Oh yeah, I'm that's really. Uh, that. That's one of those. that's like. Uh, it, it feels weird to, or it feels bad to give it the qualifier, but as a debut, it reaches a, a level that's like, okay, great. This is going to set the stage mm. for something. For for yeah. a director that's going to be really great. There's parts of it that I think you might pick is like that feels like a first time decision or okay. or derivative also, sort of all thing. The problems but, he had on set though, like yeah, I mean, no, and, and 100%. You, you can't always thinking about that because Spielberg and most had of it outweigh, set, is outweighed by the great stuff sure. and the way that it tells. Like a, um, I, I don't know if Jake and I were talking about this. It manages to tell like a, uh, it's a revenge film that also is a superhero origin story film all at once. Like, mm. like kind of vibe, like structure. See, that's wild. Cause I still have zero idea what this movie is about. It's cool. Like I've only seen promo images and I know that it's called monkey man, but like, I have no it's idea great. what it's about. So I'm it's a sequel. To- it's a secret sequel to terrifier. So you need to watch terrifier <laughs> yeah, yeah, first. You that way you're prepped and ready for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I am. I am nothing if not a completist. So I will yeah. make sure to do that. <laughs> all right. Um, let's take a really quick break and then we're going to um, get into a conversation on the other side. 
And we are back. All right. So I wanted to bring up something that happened online um, in the film community, but and sort of touch on it from from these um, thoughts I had about it and how it kind of affects our show or speaks to our show at the very least. Um, and if anyone's sort of paying attention to film Twitter in general, there was a, a guy named Scott Wampler who is a co-host of the King cast and wrote for over the years, birth movies, death and slash film and was a, an online film critic uh, for, for several years uh, and, and someone who you just couldn't not know about if you paid any attention to the film discourse. Like he, he had a really strong voice. He had an incredible sense of humor um, and was somebody that uh, I knew about um, and only got to meet him a couple of different times. But I want to talk about him from uh, talk about him from this perspective. Uh, and and I know it's this is something that you guys can relate to. We in this industry, we kind of meet people under really bizarre circumstances, like a lot of the things that we are doing or that we get to do uh, that's designated as work. And I think about like, you know, you guys going on the Orient Express, you know, from Venice to wherever it dropped you off uh, or, you know, the story I'm going to tell about Scott is, you know, going up to Bangor, Maine and getting to interview Stephen King. And we have these life experiences that like you can almost never imagine happening, but we have them with strangers. Like you're thrust into a situation where you're having this life experience with someone who you've never met before. And it's a very like crash course experience in like you're living in the moment and you're trying to experience it and you're going to have those memories forever, but you share those memories with people who you only know from that day. Right. And I find that to be really unusual because it's super intimate. You know, it's like, it, it's a, the Stephen King story it, to give you guys the reader's digest version of it is on behalf of the dark tower. Sony flew a bunch of us up to Bangor, Maine, and we did the official Stephen King tour and then we were going to see the Dark Tower that night. And right before seeing the Dark Tower, they brought us into a movie theater and Stephen King was there. And we got to interview Stephen King. And Scott Wampler was running Birth Movies Death at that time and is a diehard Stephen King fan. Obviously, he goes on to launch the King Cast podcast with Eric Vespi. Um, he was there. Uh, Haley Fouch from Collider was there. Max Avery, who was coming soon. People who I kind of knew and knew online, but was like thrust into this experience with them and had to you know, sort of acclimate ourselves with each other that day. And everybody was kind of friendly because we all had similar interests. But like it's it's there's no getting over the fact that it's an unusual way to meet somebody and then to be, you know, sort of like tossed into the day. And the one thing that I'll never forget. Is when we got the Stephen King interview, none of us knew it was going to happen. None of us knew that we were going to get the opportunity to speak to King. In fact, right before it happened, we had dinner at the Chinese restaurant that's next to the theater where he goes with his wife all the time. And when we went into the restaurant, we were all buzzing among ourselves, thinking like he's going to be here. You know, he's going to be sitting at a table. This is the moment we're going to get to meet him. And we go into the restaurant, which is actually featured in it. Chapter two, like the restaurant where the losers get together as adults is that restaurant. And he's not there. And then so then we all had to like collectively come down off of the high of like, oh, we're going to get to meet him now. It's a thing. Then we get brought over to the movie theater and brought into the thing. And and there he was. And then it was like a 20 minute, you know, interview with him. And the thing about Wampler and the thing about everybody who were in, was in that room is that they were so fucking good that like no one dropped the ball. Like everyone just came up with questions off the top of our heads and and kept going for 20 minutes. And Kevin knows because he and I just went through it. When you're in a situation like that, it can be really difficult to keep the conversation going and keep it feeling really natural. And and I'm so happy that I lived up to my end of the bargain with that, because that's how I kind of felt about Scott. And this is another aspect of it as well, too. There are certain people in our industry who, because you respect the work that they do, you read them on a regular basis, you listen to them on a regular basis with some of us, with our podcast friends. Chris Van Vliet is someone I put up there. Uh, Josh Horowitz is somebody I put up there. Uh, Ash Crossan and all the work that she does. I, Allie, obviously. Um, these are people who like you want to earn their respect. I, I'll, I want, I'd let, I'll let you guys weigh in on that as well, too. But this is just me personally. Like you want to kind of live up to their expectations. You want to kind of feel like you are playing on a level playing field as those guys are. And so even though I only interacted with Scott a bunch of times after our trip, we remained kind of close and, and stayed friends and I always wanted to just kind of live up to his expectations and, and 
have him think that the work that we were doing was really important. And I think there are people in our film community who we kind of hold to that standard. Perry Nemiroff being another one who's all of a sudden getting like, you know, lampooned slightly on social media because she was part of a Star Wars interview that went south. And it's great to see everybody kind of stand up for Perry and be like, hey, that's ridiculous. She's one of the best that's out there. And there was something that happened on the King cast. Scott and Eric had me come on when they were going to do a bonus Patreon episode about um, the trip to Banger. And we got to relive the stories and we told all of our little insides. And I talked about getting sick on the on this um, lobster roll that we ended up eating at the at the truck stop where they filmed Maximum Overdrive and all these crazy stories. And at the end of it, Wampler said, uh, if you guys haven't listened to Real Blend, their guest list is like off the charts ridiculous. He's like, it's crazy the types of people that you guys get a chance to talk to and your conversations are amazing. And that one compliment sustained me for like a year. You know, it was like a year. Like I, I went back and listened to that audio an embarrassing amount of times because somebody who I admired a ton complimented our show. And so what I saw after he passed um, and it was, I mean, he's ridiculously young and, you know, it was sudden. I don't really know what happened a hundred percent. He, he went way too soon, but there was this outpouring of support uh, for him and this outpouring of the impact that he had uh, on, on people, on film writers, on, on film lovers who just paid attention to it. And it got me thinking a lot about, the things we don't say to people when they're here, you know, and the and the compliments that we pay to people who we admire in this industry. This is a really strange business. You know, uh, we don't talk. We talk a lot about it on this show. We don't stop to think enough about how bizarre it is. <laughs> um, you know, we're four people from four corners of the of the world that came together because we love movies and we have similar tastes. But there's a lot of people like this out there in this film community that that I I want to start personally propping up more, you know, and paying respects to uh, while they're here. And that was my huge takeaway from it is that I admired Wampler a ton. It was really refreshing to see everybody speak so highly of him because I do think I also have these other people who I keep on a platform and I think that they're special in the film community. And and maybe we can be that for other people. Maybe we are that for other people. I don't even know. You know, maybe people... I, it's It's weird that this all came on the tail end of us, you know, having a couple of weeks off and and running around and and hearing from a lot of people saying like, when are you three getting back together again to talk? I miss having all three of you guys together, you know, in a weird kind of way, it reminded me how important it is for us to keep doing what we're doing and to have these conversations. But I don't know, there's a long kind of way for me to go around, but saying like, I'm going to miss his voice a ton, but I, uh, I learned from this that I'm going to tell colleagues, you know, a lot more often, not you two, but other people uh, that they're really good at what people they do. <laughs> Yeah, the people who, who don't Mainly hear it me. enough. Mainly me. <laughs> it's going to slack me in the middle of the day. So I don't know. Do you guys have that as well, too? Do you feel like there's people you try to live up to the a bar that they haven't even known that they've set? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're I think we're we're lucky enough to um, just by nature of what we do hear from from people in different corners of the world. And 99.9% and of the people are incredibly kind and have just very, very kind things to say. And the fact that they stop anyone stops what they're doing in their, in their busy life to, to listen to us for five minutes or to, you know, watch one of our videos on YouTube or whether, whatever they, like that's, that's always kind of blowing me away, but you're right. There are a couple of, of people in the industry that like, you know, when you when you get a win, you know, and you're and you feel good about an interview, like that's a cool feeling. But when you get a win and it's coupled with, you know, one of those people mm. messaging you going like, all right, dude, like that that one was that one was something. And you guys are mm. you guys are that because I feel like we so, you know, we're we, we also often like are very complimentary of each other's work. But I also do think every once in a while we like actually really do take make a point to like reach out to. And Sean, you're also very good about like, you know, quote tweeting and stuff, you know, doing like, and so yeah, there, there are, there are a couple of people that like when you hear from them and, and it's all the people that you named, it's Allie, it's Ash, it's Josh, it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. Perry, it's, you know, people that you go like, damn, okay. Like that person thought I got a win. So, and that person gets consistent wins. So we must be doing all right. And, you know, and it's, it, there's that, you know, just to kind of wrap up like to your, your point, John, that like, I love that we're talking about Scott. There's that old 
cliche and Kevin, you, you talk about this idea a lot too. this, this idea of like, you know, you die twice, you die when your physical body dies and then you die a second time when the last person talks about you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you want to think that like after you're gone, like what are, you know, that people are going to say things about you. And then maybe, you know, if you had enough of an impact on people, you know, you'll, you'll live a little bit longer because people might still talk about you. And I, I think anyone who, you know, I didn't personally know, Scott, you know, I think we had a couple of interactions on social media, but they were always fun and positive and funny. Um, and, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's got a whole generation of people who who were impacted by his work. And so in that way, like, you know, and it's Kevin, how you talk about, you know, how people live on in film. You know, there's there's a, there's an immortality that comes with with talent and, and the people who, who I admire in this yeah. profession uh, make me kind of attempt to strive for that every day. And, and he yeah. was definitely one of them. I mean, ultimately, I heard comedians talk about it this way. And I once I heard it described this way, I, I can only think of it this way. They talk about like how influential a comedian like Dave Attell is. And they say there's a ton of Attell babies out there that are just comics who are kind of doing their own riff on Attell. And I think the last thing we can say about Wampler is that like there's going to be a ton of Wampler babies behind him. And no one's going to be able to do it nearly as well. You know, it's, that's a unique voice. And so, um, but, you know, if he inspires a hundred kids to try it, then God bless them. You know, I hope they get, I hope they get their shot and I hope they one day get to hop on a plane, a private plane and interview their idols uh, because that was a once in a lifetime experience that I will never, ever, ever, ever forget. All right. Uh, listen, at theaters this weekend, things are getting busy. Hitman, Bad Boys 4, The Watchers. We have the well, Axolite seeing, on seeing Disney the Plus. Tonight. Are you really? Yeah, because I'm interviewing. Watch? I'm interviewing uh, her tomorrow. You're gonna watch the Watchers. That, I am. There you go. Who watches uh, the Watchers? All of that is dropping this week. Let us the know strangers. in the comments what you are the checking Watchmen. out, and then uh, uh, tell us why you chose what you're choosing to go see in the comments. In the meantime, we'll be back with a brand new episode next week. We've got, like I said, some pretty exciting guests lined up, and a few more if it happens. In the pipeline, in the meantime, follow us on social media at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach, and the show is at Real Blend. Thank you guys for coming back around. We'll talk to you next week.